coming up on One Detroit. A Future of Work report on the University of Michigan's groundbreaking approach to using artificial intelligence on campus. Plus, we'll have a truly Detroit story on how the area's unique take on egg rolls is grabbing national attention. Also ahead, a new program at the downtown boxing gym is helping young people learn their way around the kitchen. And Cinco de Mayo arrives this weekend. We'll tell you all about some of the local celebrations, along with what else is happening around town. It's all coming up next on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit PBS. DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit PBS. Among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving, we support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Learn more at DTEFoundation.com. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Just ahead on One Detroit, we'll look at the evolution of the egg roll into multicultural versions served Detroit style. Plus, a Detroit chef takes her talents to the downtown boxing gym to inspire kids to cook and eat healthy. And Peter Worf of 90.9 WRCJ has some great ideas on how you can spend your weekend and beyond in Metro Detroit. But first up, our Future of Work report examines the use of artificial intelligence on college campuses. The University of Michigan created its own AI tools for use by the campus community. I visited U of M to learn more about the rollout of the AI platform and the impact it will have in the classroom and on the future workforce. At the end of November 2022, San Francisco-based company OpenAI released the artificial intelligence chatbot ChatGPT that can write entire essays, create reports, do administrative tasks, and a laundry list of other things. In August 2023, the University of Michigan became the first major educational institute to release its own artificial intelligence tools made specifically for students, faculty, and staff. VP of Information Technology and Chief Information Officer for U of M, Dr. Ravi Pense, played a role in getting the AI tools created. U of M has uh, essentially uh, developed, partnered with vendor partners and introduced uh, three tools. One is called the UMGPT. UMGPT functions like OpenAI's ChatGPT, with the major difference being the data received and produced by UMGPT is kept private by the university. Second tool that we rolled out then was we made a code less platform available to the entire campus community called Maisie. What uh, Maisie does is essentially anybody, no programming, coding experience required, can actually take the Maisie platform, point it to their appropriate data source. So if you have some data, say, in your Google Drive or Dropbox or on the web or your bunch of videos, you can point Maisie to it. And what Maisie will do is it will ingest and index all of that information and then it's available to you as your own personal AI assistant for you to query and ask questions. The third release from U of M is an AI toolkit that provides the resources and computing power for campus AI research and experts. UMGPT toolkit provides access to those researchers who are the AI experts who can then start building their own models. Because of the capabilities of the AI tools, educators across the country have concerns over potential plagiarism, cheating, and abuse by students. Currently, there is no software that can reliably tell if AI has been used in writing, image generation, audio, or video content, which means there's no way to definitively know if a student has used artificial intelligence in their work. So institutions like U of M had a choice to make. We had two ways of looking at it at Michigan. One way was we could just say, we'll just step back and let's just wait out and see what the world will do and then maybe we can react. The other way was, you know, let's uh, thoughtfully approach this technology and let's lead. 
faculty at the school had been thinking about how to integrate AI into their courses. David Jurgens is an associate professor in the School of Information's Department of Computer Science and taught a first-of-its-kind course called How to Use AI Effectively. I think as a university, we're trying to figure out how to get students to engage with this in a productive, collaborative way uh, without sort of losing their you know, critical thinking skills. So the course was designed to walk students through a bunch of different exercises on how to do that. And we, as an experimental course, we were learning how to do it as well as the students were at the same time. U of M student Shantasia King is majoring in user experience at U of M's School of Information. She took Jurgen's course. It was his class that kind of hit that light switch for me. Um, I started off, I could be a student, you know, just asking it to give me the answers, complete this homework for me, but you're not learning anything. Cutting corners will get you nowhere. But when you actually sit down and you can have it, you know, create um, test studies for you or create like study plans or study guides, or if you're really stuck on something, this can become your own personal tutor right here. I just kind of had to change my outlook towards chat GPT, understanding that it's not the end all be all. It won't provide you exactly everything that you're looking for. So you don't want your work to get lost in it. So you have to work with it, provide the context that you want to see, and you would be really surprised at what you can work with it and get back. The way Shantasia is thinking about AI is what Jurgens was hoping his course would achieve. We teach them different ways to use that tool to be better versions of themselves, but not to replace themselves with AI. So I tell students, you, maybe you could get ideas for what to write about. You could ask ChatGPT questions on how to improve your draft. But to think about it like a teaching assistant, you can use it as a kind of always collaborative person who's awake any hour of the day, who could work with you to like help you and provide feedback and guidance on where it could be improved. Shantasia is seeing results outside of the classroom. So it really has opened the doors to a lot of things for me as a student as far as not even only academically, but when someone asks me to create your vision statement or show me what your future looks like or what does the business that you want to run look like, I happily go and talk to ChatGPT. I don't just ask it to tell me, I tell it what I want to see and then ask it to input its input. Artificial intelligence tools are also being developed to remove barriers to gaining access to higher education. Yearly, every year, about $4 billion in Pell Grants go unused. We are building a public Maisie. And what I mean by public Maisie would be something that would be publicly available to the entire country to use. And what this Maisie will do is it, is, it is actually ingesting and indexing all of the scholarships that are out there, not just Pell Grants. This public version of Maisie would make it easier to find out what scholarships and grants a student is eligible for. You as a user, you will be able to type in your situation where you may say, I'm 17 year old, you know, high school student, I have this kind of GPA, I've done these things, and I'm interested in these areas. Can you identify for me some scholarships that are available? And then this system in probably 15 seconds will find you all of the relevant scholarships that you may have opportunity for. You know, uh, what I said to my team when I challenged them is I said, you know, even if 20 people are able to go to college because of this, it'll be worth it. As U of M's campus community and the public use these AI tools, the technology will continue to improve. But Dr. Pensei's optimism for the future rests more in people than artificial intelligence. You know, the young people are so wonderful and are so wanting each one of them to contribute something positive to the world. So I'm very confident that no matter what field they choose to uh, pursue, as long as they're passionate about it, the AI tools will be available and they can change the world for better. Turning now to a story that's truly Detroit. The city is famous for its Detroit style pizza and Coney Island hot dogs. Now the egg roll is poised to take its place in the region's storied culinary history. One Detroit's Bill Kubota looks at how the traditional Chinese-American egg roll has evolved into a deep-fried treat with a variety of multicultural fillings in the Detroit area. I feel like I got a two-handed, it's so big, but, but if I just... <laughs> Tom Perkins, Detroit food writer, checking out Sister Roll Street Eats. 
the home of an array of oversized egg rolls in Allen Park. Them big old egg rolls on a stick. Everybody know the tag, Sister Rose, because they know where it come from. So it was a big marketing thing. That's for Uber Eats. This one for DoorDash. The evolution of the Detroit-style egg roll. It begins with the spring roll, which really is eaten in Asia. But it's here in the U.S. where the egg roll was created. Some credit a Chinese restaurant in New York almost a century ago. But who really knows? And why are they called egg rolls? Not shaped like an egg, not a trace of egg inside, just maybe an egg wash to keep the wrapper together. Who really knows? We do know this. In Detroit, Chinese restaurant egg rolls have been known for containing a lot of bean sprouts that helps with that satisfying crunch. Other places use more cabbage, a more economical option, let's say. But our Detroit egg roll story really starts with corned beef. Corned beef culture, as uh, somebody once put it to me in Detroit, dates back to, I mean, gosh, 100 years ago. There's a big Jewish population in Detroit, and they, they opened all these corned beef shops, and then the Jewish folks left town. Uh, African-American folks who moved into the neighborhoods enjoyed corned beef. So some of the restaurants that were there that had like, been around for 60 years stayed in business. Then in the late 1970s, a woman from Vietnam, Kim White, she put corned beef and cheese in an egg roll wrapper, called it Asian corned beef. Fusion cuisine before most even heard of that term. Asian corned beef, I think, was Kim White, the, the woman who opened that. I think she's generally credited with inventing the dish. But it really started to pop like about 10 years ago. More and more corned beef egg roll purveyors popped up around town. You know, it's not to the level of Detroit-style pizza or a Coney dog yet, but it's it's getting there. It's, it's getting to that, that territory of, of almost a regional food dish. Egg rolls is a Detroit thing. I can say it's part of our culture. And then Asian corned beef. I love their egg rolls. They don't have a lot of variety. My goal was like pretty much to piggyback off of them and just make it bigger and wider. So my wife was like, came up with a great idea because I used to always make Alfredo egg rolls for whenever we made Alfredo at home, I made the egg rolls. Alfredo egg rolls with chicken and broccoli on the menu. It was a hit. So I was like, everything can go in the egg roll. The list goes on. Corned beef with mozzarella cheese. Chicken shawarma. We got 313 dog. That's corned beef, ground beef. Bacon. 19 different kinds of egg roll. I can't even remember them all. Now, this is the first time that I've had an egg roll on a stick. Sister Roll Street Eats got started five years ago. Mm. Portia and Crevassier Jackson are entrepreneurs. They started with a food trailer. Word got out through social media. Their egg rolls were an instant hit. But TikTok now, I am like real, getting real big on there because everybody is tagging me continuously. We are a must try restaurant right now. Blew all the way to Detroit for this. Man, social media have blew us up so big and I can't even um, like imagine if we didn't have TikTok, how would it be? I can't even imagine it, you know? Trying a place called Sister Rose Street Eats. Mr. Chimes time, because everybody was tagging him to come here. And he was like, I had to come here. The people would not let me not come here. I've done my research and I do see that some people like it, some people don't. And I'm here to put the nail in the coffin to let you guys what is really hitting on. I ordered all the popular menu items. I was scared, like, I don't know what he is about to say. So, oh my God, it's like I was in here like losing it. Like, I'm not ready for that. Mm. Salmon. So we got salmon, looks like, what's that? Spinach dip and Swiss cheese. I do like the fact it is stuffed, and I mean stuffed with meat. Y'all will love this. You like egg rolls. You need to stop whatever you're doing and get these egg rolls now. Is it a Chinese dish? No. Is it a, an Asian dish? The person who invented it was a Vietnamese immigrant, so you got that, that connection, but I'm not sure it goes much deeper than that. No, this is a long way from Chinese here. This is delicious and it's big. At Sister Rolls, another favorite, a pizza style filling. Innovative? Well, it's not a new idea. A pizza, pizza, pizza roll. The original pizza roll goes back to 1965, brought to you by a guy in Minnesota named Gino. This is America's favorite hot snack. The pizza roll. Gino Paolucci, a proud Italian who owned the Chungking Foods Company, which made little frozen egg rolls. Gino thought, why not put something else in there? All those good things rolled into America's favorite hot snack. Gino sold out to Totino's, which still makes them today. 
still little bite-sized things. Well, number 92, you are as you. Chinese, Vietnamese, Jewish, Italian, and then there's the Irish. So we'll get ourselves an Irish egg roll here. You gotta take it. You, you really do have to, in my opinion, anyway, you really do have to have a little bit of the, the Blarney mustard sauce. I think that it, it just makes it. At McShane's Irish pub in Detroit's Cork Town, Bob Roberts had leftover corned beef he wanted to repurpose into another dish. That was 12 years ago. Somebody had the idea, let's try and roll them up in a wonton and deep fry them. The first set was pretty good, but then we wanted to jazz it up a little bit. So uh, now they're made with corned beef, red skin potato, braised cabbage, Swiss cheese, and scallions. We had never had one of the Asian corned beef uh, egg rolls before. We had never heard of them. So then it seems it's the luck of Detroiters to have so many egg roll choices. You could get into a debate there. Well, is this an Irish thing or is this a Detroit thing? And all right, fine, if you're putting potatoes in it. But really, like, at the end of the day, who cares? It's, it's a corned beef egg roll. It is a thing in Detroit, and it's delicious. So why are we debating? In addition to playing sports and getting help with homework, students at the downtown boxing gym on Detroit's east side are getting a lesson in the culinary arts. The kids are learning how to prepare nutritious meals in the organization's new commercial kitchen. Bridge Detroit's Michael Walker has more on the nonprofit's latest program for students. Every day after school, hundreds of kids head to downtown boxing gym on Detroit's east side to shoot some hoops, get help with their homework, or hit the boxing ring. And they're also having fun in the kitchen. That's Molly Mitchell, the new associate director of culinary arts for the downtown boxing gym. She prepares fresh, from scratch meals and snacks for DBG students each night, totaling more than a thousand meals per week. Mitchell is also teaching kids how to cook nutritious meals and is developing a culinary arts curriculum for the organization. Downtown Boxing Gym serves students ages 8 to 18 across Metro Detroit with continued mentorship and support through the age of 25. Mitchell was the owner of Rose's Fine Food on Jefferson, which shut its doors last year. Um, when I closed Roses last year, I was really interested in like going into culinary education in some manner. And so it just like really worked out for me to um, sort of get in contact with DBG at the same time that I was closing Roses because they were ready to like really flat flesh out their program, their cooking program, because they just opened this amazing commercial kitchen. The timing really worked out for me to come here and um, I'm able to pursue my passion and also like help them out with their commercial kitchen. So it's just like a really good match. Molly, what's it been like um, creating this culinary arts program? I'm really inspired by the kids at DBG because they're super into cooking and so I really let them take the lead on what they're interested in and I'm just trying to like shape it in terms of having like a very complete culinary education. So learning about, you know, food safety and like sauces and roasting meats and everything in between. So it's been great. Oh yeah, that was great. Three, you know, the three, three more three. decisive chives, yeah, put it in. And what kind of healthy meals are you preparing for the kids? You know, we have breakfast for dinner sometimes, we have tacos, we make braises. I'm really trying to get the kids into vinaigrette. We also make ranch sometimes, which is really <laughs> the most requested. I'm just like trying to like find out what they really are into and then also just like throw some wild cards in. Mm, that's different, but it's good. Yeah, awesome. I know kids can be notorious for being picky eaters. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make uh, making healthy foods fun and simple? So that was actually like my biggest fear starting here that the kids would be so picky that I would really be like hindered in what I could make for them. And to my surprise, like the kids are pretty open-minded about trying most things that we make. We, I would say like about 85% of the kids at dinner time are game to try whatever we make. And then there's like a smaller percentage that do have like 
well, we have kids with dietary restrictions and allergies, but also some pickier kids. And I just try to like maybe work with them and uh, have like some plainer options available when we do serve dinner. And Molly has some big plans for the curriculum, including a guest chef's program. They'll teach a class and then it's my hope that they'll give us a recipe that we can actually make for dinner just to have even like a broader range of point of view for the kids to um, try new things that like I wouldn't have thought to make as well. We're also working on a, a garden um, outside, like a kitchen garden near the soccer field that we'll be able to have like a teaching space within the garden where we'll be able to grow food that we can harvest, bring in here so kids can see everything from seed to meal. For downtown boxing gym founder Kali Sweeney, teaching children how to cook and where their food comes from has been a priority since the organization started in 2007. Why did you want to add um, culinary arts to the curriculum here? Food brings people together. Um, it's also the fuel that our body needs to get through the day. You know, how can you go to school and function at a high level if you may have only had a bowl of cereal or something or there's no lunch program at your school? So I wanted the gym to be that, that, that space where you can come get a, a, a healthy meal, uh, learn about um, eating healthy and, and just being a healthy overall person. And uh, why was it important for the kids to get outside and see how food is grown? Learning how to grow food straight from the ground, no preservatives, none of that type of stuff, you know, that's, that's, that's a wonderful skill to have. Um, and just getting back to nature and, and, and learning how to farm and stuff like that, that, that is a, a life skill. I thought it was important that kids were able to do that. We're just gonna make a quick coleslaw. Well, we can eat this for dinner with our, uh, our pizza. Well, something you learned to cook here with Molly. Yeah. We learned how to make smoothies, pancakes, yogurt, yeah. <laughs> we frosty cakes. You see yourselves having a future um, doing culinary arts? Yes. Yeah. I want to be a chef now. Are you going to open your own restaurant? Yeah, I'm going to try. And I even got to join in on the taste test. Okay, let's taste it and see what it means something. What are your goals for the culinary arts program? My goal is to really like build out a program that is not only really informative and like if somebody wanted to go get a job in a restaurant they could after taking this program but really I'm trying to just cement an excitement for food that can be like a lifelong passion whether you're working in a restaurant or you're just learning how to cook like really amazing meals for yourself and your loved ones. If you're looking to celebrate Cinco de Mayo this weekend, there are several events happening around town. Plus, there are theater productions and spring activities to enjoy in Metro Detroit. Peter Worf of 90.9 WRCJ has the rundown in today's One Detroit Weekend. Hi, I'm Peter Worf with 90.9 WRCJ. And as we head into May, we have the opportunity to take advantage of some great spring days and some great local events. First up, now through June 2nd, Detroit Public Theater is featuring Clyde's, a play about formerly incarcerated kitchen staff who are trying to come up with the perfect sandwich at their truck stop sandwich shop. And a classic has come to town in the show, Annie. It takes the Fox Theater stage tomorrow through Sunday. So excited to hear all of the fantastic songs that come with the musical. And you know, this weekend is the celebration of Cinco de Mayo, and Detroit has many different ways to honor the holiday, like the 59th annual Cinco de Mayo Parade and Fiesta happening in Southwest Detroit, May 5th. The theme for this year is La Historia de Southwest, showcasing all the different Latin cultures represented in Southwest Detroit. Another way to participate in Cinco de Mayo Sunday is the Cinco de Mayo 5K Fun Run for Mental Health Awareness at Clark Park. And on May 8th, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson is in Detroit presenting Search for Life in the Universe. He'll discuss ongoing research to find habitable planets and other life forms in the universe. Plus, there's so much more to do in and around Detroit, so here are a few more events. Have a wonderful weekend. That'll do it for this week's One Detroit. Thanks for watching. Head to the One Detroit website for all the stories we're working on. 
follow us on social media, and sign up for our weekly newsletter. We'll leave you now with the sights and sounds of the record-breaking NFL Draft in Detroit. This program is made possible in part by Timothy Bogert, Comprehensive Planning Strategies. From Delta faucets to Bear Paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit PBS. DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit PBS. Among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving, we support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Learn more at dtefoundation.com. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you.